For those of you I don't know, I am Judy Kroll, and I am um, a new faculty member in education this year, uh, and very thrilled to be in the School of Education, even though I think I can count on my two hands the number of times I've been to campus recently. Uh, but we are also <laughs> thrilled that um, Professor uh, Ingrid Finger is here with us from Brazil uh, for a sabbatical this year, uh, visiting our lab and the School of Education. Uh, and, and as all of us know, this has been an extremely frustrating time to be um, visiting anyone, anywhere. Um, but despite that, um, we are really, really very, very happy to have her uh, with us. Um, uh, Ingrid has been uh, studying um, bilingualism and bilingual development in Brazil, uh, examining issues that are common to many of the interests of many of us uh, in the school and in the audience. Uh, more generally, looking at uh, issues of literacy development. She's looked at numerical cognition. She's looked at working memory. Uh, she's looked at a set of issues um, that are really crucial in terms of understanding success among um, young emerging bilinguals. Uh, and one of the things I'll just mention that we also are hoping that very soon we will be able to officially announce uh, the launch of we, our intended branch of uh, the organization Bilingualism Matters. Um, and it is exactly this kind of research that will help us to bridge between uh, what we do in our laboratories in academic settings and partnering with the community of bilingual speakers uh, in, the, in the world around us. So um, I am just thrilled to uh, introduce Ingrid uh, to tell us about bilingualism and cognition research in Brazil, implications for bilingual education. Um, Ingrid, I think you can share your screen if you'd like to. And I just wanna say that I think what we're going to do, it's up to you, but if you wanna have questions held except for clarification, and then we will have time at the end for discussion. And if you'd like to leave questions in the chat, we can try to monitor that, but we'll also open things and you can raise your hand in Q&A um, once Ingrid has completed her talk. So welcome everyone. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen, but first of all, I would like to say that it's such an honor to be, for me to be here today. And thank you, Judy and the organizers of the uh, Brown Bag Colloquium at the School of Education at UCI for the opportunity to be here, for the opportunity to share the some of the research that we've been conducting in Brazil and um, hear your feedback, right? That, that means a lot to me and, and to my colleagues and students who are you know, here today too. So um, I'll begin with some uh, contextual background regarding the enormous linguistic diversity that characterizes Brazil, uh, bringing some recent data. Um, and then after that, I'm going to present some of the studies that we have been conducting in our lab, focusing mainly on the studies that investigate bilingual education context, bilingual education context in Brazil in particular. So um, the underlying uh, premise of these studies is our need, our interest in understanding how early bilingual experiences affect language processing, cognitive processing, and academic performance uh, in the context of bilingual education in, in Brazil. So uh, some background. Um, Brazil is a country with enormous linguistic diversity, right? and is certainly not a monolingual country, you know, which is uh, may seem at first, right? We have no official statistics regarding uh, the languages that are spoken in Brazil, but we know that the country possesses huge language diversity. So, from what we know is that there are around 330 languages that are used daily in the country. Um, among those 
274 are indigenous languages. And this is according to our census 2010. Um, this is the last official data that we have. It's sort of, you know, somewhat old. Uh, so we were supposed to have a 2020 census again, but it was canceled due to the pandemics. And then it was supposed to be taking place in two, uh, 2021 last year, but then the government decided that it was not a priority. So we have no idea when the next census is going to be. And it's also important to clarify that the census doesn't have any questions regarding language that people speak or language use. So the information that we have about indigenous languages uh, refers to other questions, and then we assume that these are the indigenous languages, but it doesn't, we don't know whether some of these are varieties of, you know, a main language, we, we just don't know, right? Um, we also have 56 immigration languages, uh, and this is uh, some information that was published by my colleague from uh, the Federal University of Rio do Sul, Cleo Altenhofen, who's been studying immigration languages for quite some time. Um, and then there is also Libris, which is the second official language since 2002. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about these three contexts, right? Uh, but first, I'd like to point out that Brazil, you know, besides the huge linguistic diversity, there is also economic and social inequality. So Brazil is the most unequal country in Latin America and has amongst the highest inequality levels in the world. Um, and I brought here just, you know, some piece of data which uh, shows uh, this, yeah, which is the share of income held by the richest 20% in Brazil from 2011-2019 was 57.8% of all the, you know, the income, right? So this is just, you know, very quick information that shows what I mean when we talk about economic and social inequality. And of course, this has, um, this, in, this brings lots of um, challenges in terms of public education in, in Brazil, right? In terms of language, there is still a lot of prejudice and misinformation uh, about bilingualism, especially with respect to the status of immigrant languages, indigenous languages, and Brazilian sign language. And I brought here um, this um, sign, which is from 1949. It's written in Portuguese, but this was uh, um, uh, this is from a city very near where I live, near Porto Alegre, which is called São Lourenço do Sul, and it's from 1945. Uh, so this was part of this nationalization campaign that was imposed by the President Getúlio Vargas in the 40s, uh, which took some important repression measures uh, with the aim of reducing the influence of immigrants and foreigners in Brazil. So among the measures, one of them was the ban on the use of immigration languages because they were understood as foreign languages, right? And um, it's interesting to know that even with the restriction of use, German continued to be used in the small villages, especially in some specific places in Brazil. And it's being passed on to the new generations, keeping the heritage language alive, but also transforming it through the influence of Portuguese. So the German, the Brazilian German that's spoken in Brazil today is completely different from the German that is spoken in, in Germany, which is really cool from the perspective of research, right? So this is a map. This was created by my colleague, Claire Wolfenhofen, about the different varieties of German that are spoken um, in Brazil and the places where uh, they are more common. So German is the second most spoken language in Brazil after Portuguese, and it's native to 1.9% of the population, which is you know, a huge amount of people. And uh, even though there are more Italian immigrants in Brazil than German immigrants, German immigrants are the ones who speak German at home with their children uh, as their mother tongue, right? And of course, the children are descendants and now they speak heritage uh, language, right? Uh, with respect to indigenous languages, uh, there are 
536,000 indigenous identifying people in Brazil. This is the question that was asked in the census, right? So whether you identify yourself uh, as an indigenous person, right? Uh, and the number is that 0.25% uh, of the total population falls into this category. And there are 57 uncontacted tribes, right? Which is the largest such number in the world. So we, we basically don't know, right? But we know that, you know, from this information around 274 indigenous languages, 305 different indigenous ethnicities were identified in the census, right? Uh, and some interesting data is that 37.4 of the indigenous people aged five or older still speak an indigenous language at home, or at least they did in 2010. And uh, among those who lived in the indigenous territories, indigenous lands, that percentage increased to 57.3%, right? And 17.5% uh, of these indigenous people do not speak Portuguese at all. I mean, declare not to, right? Um, a large portion of Brazil's indigenous languages are endangered or on the verge of dying out. And as much as a third of Brazil's indigenous languages could die by 2030. Uh, so that brings the, you know, the discussion about the important role played by indigenous lands uh, in terms of maintenance of social, cultural characteristics, lifestyle, and of course, language. Right? This picture was taken by my former PhD student, Gilson Keripaldi, and it's just marvelous, you know, one of the, the tribes in, um, which he visited. Uh, he's from there. Uh, so in terms of Brazilian sign language, also, again, according to the census, 5.1% of the Brazilian population is composed of people who have some auditory impairment, which makes up to more than 10 million citizens. 78% reported to have some difficulty hearing, 19% reported to have a great hearing loss, and 4% do not hear anything at all. But um, being deaf does not mean being able to sign in Brazil, right? And um, uh, I brought some pictures of a bilingual school um, near, also near Porto Alegre, uh, but it's important to point out, point out that there is this harsh debate about bilingual schools or inclusion schools within the deaf community. Uh, and public policies have been unclear to say the least uh, with respect to what to do. So the legislation doesn't bring enough um, guidelines for what to do. And of course, there is always the difficulty in finding teachers, right, uh, for, for the context. So there are lots of situations in which uh, deaf kids are just placed inside the classroom where the teacher doesn't use sign language, students don't use sign language and it's called inclusion, but we know that inclusion is what does not happen in this context, right? So uh, we still have a long way to go with respect to, um, to Brazilian sign language. And uh, this data here is really interesting. This is from 2019. Um, and uh, it shows deaf population and sign language. So among deaf population, you know, those 5.1% uh, older than the age of five, um, the ones who reported, among the ones who reported having some difficulty hearing, only 1.8% is able to use Libras. Among those who reported to have a lot of difficulty, so they are severely, uh, moderately severe or severely impaired, only 3% declared to be able to use Libras. Uh, and among those who claim not to hear anything at all, only 35.8% is able to use Libras. Uh, so again, we still have a long way to go in terms of providing opportunities for children to have access to Libras as to a language that they can use as early as possible. Um, and then the context of uh, prestigious or what is called elite bilingual education, which is the context that has been in 
a rapid expansion expansion in the past few years, right? So this falls into a category that Baker and Wright calls enrichment bilingual education, which is when um, it, a child is provided with an opportunity to learn and speak a dominant language, um, a prestigious language apart from the dominant language of the language that is spoken in, in the society, right? So uh, this is the context which has had, you know, the, the biggest um, uh, the biggest interest. Uh, and it's an education modality that has been grown significantly in the past 10 years, but mostly in the past five years, right? Uh, and it's interesting to note that this uh, context, this education modality has been contributed, contributing to an ideological change in the recognition and encouragement of Brazilian multilingualism, right? So even though the bi bilingual education opportunities, elite bilingual education opportunities are just for very few people we, when we consider the whole population in Brazil, uh, the interest in terms of, you know, having children able to, or giving a children opportunity to learn different languages uh, has been contributing to uh, less prejudice and a little bit more knowledge with respect to the benefits of bilingualism, right? And it's uh, within this context that we conduct the research that we conduct in our, um, in our lab, right? So uh, that's why I say here that this expansion is helping to legitimize bilingual education in other contexts for deaf children, for indigenous children, for communities that live on the border because being bilingual is not something so bad after all, you know, uh, because it provides opportunities, right? And of course, there is this huge debate as to what languages, right? And in elite bilingual education, English is the language that is most common in, uh, in the schools, right? So it is a modality that has grown tremendously in the country in a way that is now has become a commodity being used by the private schools as a marketing tool to attract more students, right? And that's why uh, we see every day, we see new schools starting with, uh, with starting offering bilingual uh, curriculum or bilingual programs, right? And unfortunately, very few initiatives are have been taken to offer bilingual education in public schools, right? So some, you know, there are a few public schools which offer uh, some immigrant languages uh, and um, also English. And some of them started during the World Cup in 2016 in Rio, right? Uh, but of course the challenges are, are huge with respect to those, um, those contexts, right? And one of the problem is that we don't have a regulation regarding that. So the National Council of Education drafted out the regulation and this regulation was unanimously approved by the council in July, 2020, but it's still pending approval from the Minister of Education. So uh, this, the, these documents have been on the desk you know, the minister's desk for 18 months, right? Behind some, you know, some other papers, right? And it's been there and we just don't know. So the lack of regulation has created huge problems, you know, um, there are no guidelines regarding number of hours that schools need to offer, kinds of teacher training that are necessary, types of curriculum, types of assessment, uh, that can be used as well as expected outcomes, you know, from the students. And we have seen a mixed scenario because there are serious schools that are really committed to promoting learning, uh, learning the language and content, but there are schools without any pedagogical knowledge to do so. And they are all advertising bilingual education to parents who really don't know what they are buying, right? So uh, we, we do need the regulation to you know, help sort this out and as soon as possible, right? So in terms of prestigious elite bilingual education, uh, the models are varied exactly because we don't have a legislation, right? Um, and uh, the models vary a lot with 
respect to objectives, characteristics of students, distribution of instruction time in the languages involved, pedagogical approach, approaches and practices and other aspects. So basically, there is a huge difference between bilingual curriculum, partial immersion and bilingual programs, extended workload uh, in the second language. So the schools may vary between 40 and 60%, 50-50, 70-30. Um, in bilingual programs, which are offered uh, to some of the children whose parents can afford that. Sometimes children have 10 hours of second language lessons per week, five hours or three hours. Um, and bilingual programs do not necessarily uh, teach content in the language. So basically, you know, it's a, a greater amount of time of exposure to the language, but not necessarily academic development in the second language, right? And total immersion in the second language is offered in a few in international schools, which are way more expensive than um, good regular uh, bilingual schools, right? Um, and there are more than uh, 1,200 um, schools offering bilingual programs in Brazil. We are not sure about this number because there are no official statistics regarding that too. So this is an estimate from a couple of years ago from a sort of association of private schools, right? Uh, but we know that this number is much higher. We just, you know, haven't found a way to count them yet, right? Um, so within that context, our uh, research lab, which is called LABICO, stands for uh, Bilingualism and Cognition Lab. It's a research group that is associated with the area of psycholinguistics of the graduate programming language at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Uh, so we are located in Porto Alegre, which is the capital of the southernmost state in Brazil. We're on the border of Uruguay and Argentina, right? And uh, we develop experimental research focusing on linguistic and cognitive processing, monolingual, bilingual individuals, individuals and uses of oral or sign language. And more recently, we have been, some of our research has been focused on uh, bilingual education context with the idea of helping to create um, research background, literature background on this particular context of bilingual education uh, that takes place in Brazil, right? So some of our studies at Labico, which um, um, show our translational education research and most of them are conducted with my colleague, Birata Alves, who's here somewhere. Uh, so um, I brought, you know, a few examples and the ones that I'm going to show in this page are the ones uh, whose data has not been collected yet, right? So these are just, you know, these are just studies which are in, you know, in the beginning, there's the proposals, right? So the first one is by Marion Costa Cruz, who's Ubiratas advisee, and he's going to look at the development of phonological awareness skills in English. Uh, and the idea is to create a digital platform which will help train children to develop, um, help them train phonological awareness uh, in a digital flat platform, considering the reality of Brazil, which is English is not an additional, it's, it's not a foreign language, uh, and it's a language to which children are exposed the first time they come to school. So in bilingual schools, children are exposed to a language and learn how to read and write the same language in, in, in that language at the same time they are being exposed to it. Uh, to the language, right? And it is a prestigious language, but still it's the first time they are having access to it, right? So um, we can't just adopt, you know, materials, uh, training materials and assessments from other countries in which English is taught in a very different manner, right? So we, we do need to consider uh, the vocabulary that is uh, this developed 
at schools, the, you know, the, the level of proficiency, the amount of exposure that children have. So we need to find ways to create and develop materials that are possible and useful in the Brazilian context, right? So Alini is my postdoc student and she's designing a protocol for the assessment of Portuguese and English linguistic schools, also in first grade uh, children. Uh, there are no assessments and some of the schools use examinations like the Cambridge proficiency test, which is designed for a completely different context, right? So, so we don't have any kinds of assessment protocols in Brazil and, and there's a huge lack of research with respect to that. Uh, so Luciana is also my PhD student. She's here at the UCI and she's looking at biliteracy and phonological awareness, de awareness development in children aged five to seven years old also in the same context. Uh, Larissa is looking at second language exposure and attention. So she's going to look at uh, uh, cognitive control in bilingual school children. Uh, and then Karina is also my master's student and she's analyzing writing development in Portuguese and English in first grade children in a bilingual school. And so these are the studies which haven't, you know, for which we don't have data yet. Uh, we will soon. So now we're going to bring some examples of studies that for which we do have data. And the first one is uh, this. This was the PhD research of Karina Rebelo Cruz, who was my student at the time, and now she's my colleague at, at Burgess. She, she, she teaches at the um, uh, Letras Libres course, which is the course which prepares translators, uh, sign language translators, right? And we looked at phonological awareness, right? So we investigated the effects of early and late acquisition of Libras on phonological awareness in deaf children uh, through the assessment of three linguistic parameters. So we looked at handshake, location, and movement. So we designed a task, a phonological awareness assessment task in which children would see a video, a very short video of someone signaling. Uh, and then they had three options, uh, which um, uh, were similar in terms of either handshape, location, or movement uh, in comparison to, to the stimuli, right? Um, so it was a very complex task. And uh, the results show, the results are really, really interesting. So uh, we, we found out that children who had early acquisition of Libras, uh, so they were exposed to sign language from the age of one to four, they had lower percentage errors and they had fast, faster reaction timings in all three parameters in comparison to late acquirers, to the ones who acquired late, which is kind of obvious, you know, for what we know, but we do need research to show that, well, you know, if the child is deaf, he or she needs access to sign language as soon as possible, uh, which is not a practice advised by speech therapists and uh, doctors normally in Brazil, unfortunately. Uh, so we do need research to show that this is what should be done. And uh, in, in our perspective, discovering evidence of the benefits of early sign language acquisition of children in contrast to the disadvantages of late exposure right, can be used to advocate for their access to sign language as, as early as possible. So studies like this have you know, a tremendous impact uh, in terms of um, improving children's quality of life, you know, by providing them with access to, to a language. Mm -hmm. um, the other study I like to mention is this one uh, about bilingualism and numerical cognition, which was um, uh, Karina Santos and, and I conducted a couple of years ago. Um, so we investigated whether high proficiency bilingual speakers of Portuguese and English would show any preference in reading numbers when solving simple addition problems, taking into consideration their bilingual background experience. So we looked at English teachers who had an enormous experience in English. Most of them reported to have learned English 
way over 20, 30 years before and uh, using English to listen to music, to watch TV and uh, read and, you know, teach during the whole week. So most of their waking time involves English, right? And it's been like that for quite some time. So we were interested in um, assessing whether this background with the language, which is a lot of exposure, right? If, we'll, if that would um, interfere with their preference uh, in terms of um, solving simple mathematical problems involving addition, right? So we had this addition task uh, and there were three blocks of stimuli and um, participants would see the calculus in um, uh, numbers and letters in Portuguese and, and in English, right? And then what we found was that there was a main effect of format block, right? Confirming what previous literature brings, right? And uh, there was no effect of language background to our surprise, right? And studies like this uh, have major pedagogical implications for bilingual education, reinforcing the importance of teaching school subjects in both the child's language, right? So uh, it shows the role of language of instruction, acquisition, and consolidation of basic mathematical knowledge. And so if we want children to develop, academically develop in the two languages, we need to start early and we need to provide them with a lot of opportunities for practice, right? So learning a language just in some contexts will have an effect on the context that this person will be able to use that language later on. Right. Um, so, of course, we need more studies that review that, uh, that investigate that. Uh, and the study, which I'm going to report in a little bit more detail, is this one, uh, which was recently published and uh, analyzes the effect of biliteracy on thought organization, synthetic complexity in written production by 11 year old children. And uh, um, this, is, this was a pilot study uh, conducted by Cristiani Lenke uh, as part of her uh, PhD dissertation. And um, it's a collaboration between uh, my university and um, um, the Brain Institute at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, uh, in, um, in which Janaina Weissheimer is a, is a professor. And then there's Natalia Mota from um, uh, Rio de Janeiro. She's, uh, she's like the brain behind the speech graph program that we use, right? Um, so I'm going to report some of these, uh, the results that we find, that we found. So previous literature regarding um, development children's biliteracy highlights the need for pedagogies that support young bilingual children, uh, children's biliteracy, right? So this is sort of a consensus in the literature, but there is a scarce literature on how early language experience impacts later language development and processing. And we know that one of the most important aspects is exactly the amount and quality of language exposure, right, in, in the two languages, right? Um, so in, within that context, uh, considering what, uh, you know, the Brazilian context, we, it's imperative to better understand bilingual children's reading and writing development. Uh, in considering the Brazilian educational context so that we can help design instructional pedagogies that support the students' growth as readers and writers. So remember that um, children in Brazil, in bilingual elite schools, they are first exposed to a prestigious language at the moment that they enter school, right? Uh, and they need to develop reading and writing and in a language they are just becoming familiar with. Right. So that's a huge challenge. Right. Uh, so our main goal was to investigate the effects of bilingualism and biliteracy on levels of thought organization, cognitive imageries, and synthetic complexity in the written production in Portuguese and English in a group of children enrolled in a bilingual school in the south 
of Brazil. And for that, we used a novel application of network science and graph theory uh, in the investigation of uh, writing development in bilingual kids. Uh, so uh, we are always interested in, you know, in, in, in recent, uh, you know, more uh, recent work within language sciences, particularly bilingualism. Uh, we have been looking for innovative methods to evaluate and characterize how people um, differentially use uh, language across different communicative contexts and, of course, the long-term effects of language experiences on mind, brain, and, and language processing, right? So our idea was uh, was to do something, you know, within that, that context, right? So we tested 15 typically developing children uh, enrolled in fifth and sixth grade in a bilingual school. And of course, the children's home and community language is Portuguese, but they have been taught English classes um, in Portuguese. They have been taught classes in Portuguese and English for at least five years, right? So these, these children go to school for 33 hours per week, and they have a huge workload, 10 hours a week of English, apart from the Portuguese. Um, and the data were were collected in August 2020 during regular online classes, right? Uh, so during the pandemics and um, participants were asked to create a narrative on a sequence of five images uh, based on the Flyers Cambridge exam, right? So they should look at the pictures and just create a narrative. And they did that in Portuguese. And, and also in English, you know, similar narratives. And this is part, you know, these pictures, this kind of task is very, is very natural to them because it's part of the Cambridge examination that these children take at school, right? So they have been preparing for exams like that, um, you know, their whole lives, uh, their whole school lives, right? So they did this in Portuguese and English. What, you know, they are not used to doing the same kind of task in Portuguese, but they do, you know, similar tasks in Portuguese, right? So we consider this a very natural setting in terms of data collection, because it doesn't differ from, you know, what children are normally uh, used to doing at school, right? Which uh, we believe makes a huge impact on on, the, on 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 their production, right? So uh, we looked at development of thought connectivity first and second language, and then we use graph analysis to do you know graphs like this, which I'm going to talk about. So this is just an example, um, and you know one of the measures the net levels of connectivity were always higher in their L1, like, you know, 150, and then a little bit lower in the second language. Um, so this is based on speech graphs tool, uh, which was tool designed by uh, Natalia Mota. And it's ha it has been used um, in, in several studies with respect to uh, measuring, with, with the goal of measuring thought connectivity, right, um, thought organization. So it was first designed to analyze, um, to analyze thought connectivity in um, patients with some sort of mental disorder, schizophrenic or psychosis, right? And uh, he was uh, able to predict cognitive loss uh, in case of mental disorders, right? Uh, but what about uh, typical development, right? So the first study came uh, so the ability to plan and report a complex and well-connected story seems to evolve with education and literacy in the absence of any clinical condition, right? Uh, but is it, can we use it as a way to naturalistic assess cognitive and linguistic performance in the case of kids being taught in two languages at the same time uh, as an ecological tool to measure um, their development, their linguistic development, right? So the first study which did that um, was published in 2016. And in this study, um, the authors analyzed 
they, they did multiple, multiple linear regression analysis and showed a very robust correlation between reading scores and connect connectivity, right? So they looked at IQ, tier of mind and reading and uh, graphs were able to predict um, um, development. So this was the pioneer study in using, apl applying graph analysis uh, in children's speech and um, typically developing children's speech, right? So this was done in, um, in public school settings and it's a, it's a really cool paper. It's worth reading. It's really, really cool. So this is an example of one of the components that we analyze, LCC. Uh, so it's basically an analysis of the number of nodes or the number of words that are connected by an edge. So we see this whole information, right? Um, Eu era pequenininho e eu chupava bubu, which is um, an example of, you know, one of the analysis that is possible to make. There are, you know, several analyses, right? But these two are the ones that have been showing more, uh, more interesting information. Um, so um, LSC, which is the other component, uh, shows the number of nodes that are connected by direct edges. So node A reaches node B and node B reaches node A, right? So we look at a smaller part of the network, okay? So we had two hypotheses here. I'm not going to talk about the results regarding syntactic complexity because I don't have much time. So um, I, yeah, we should be finishing it. So we expected to find a significant difference in uh, connectivity attributes in the first and second language generated by children's reading production. And of course, with an advantage for their first language. And this is exactly what we we found, right? Um, but then we would like to see whether these connectivity attributes uh, in the first and second language would develop somewhat parallel Right, and this is exactly what we find. We, we were able to find. So that means that uh, when children have low connectivity in the first language, in the second language, they also have low connectivity in the first language. So we are not comparing a child to another one. We are comparing the same child in the two languages, and we found this really strong correlation, which was um, uh, indication that you know both languages seem to be developing, thought organizations seem to be developing in parallel in the two languages, right? So this is an example of a high uh, LS, LCC um, component, and this is an example of low connectivity. You know, a child who has low connectivity in one language also has low connectivity in the other one, right? Uh, so, we show that as children advance in development of more complex writing strategies in Portuguese, they also seem to progress in their written production in English to the same extent, right? And um, it's uh, important to show that, you know, the, the, the use of naturalistic and, uh, and accessible tools can help us understand way more, you know, thought organization and linguistic development in, in children. So uh, this is a study that is being going on. So Ana Paula is my PhD student. She has collected all the data and we are beginning to organize the data to analyze it. And she's looking at uh, connectivity in written production in two different kinds of texts. Uh, so she collected 384 texts uh, high school students, and we will be analyzing with co-metrics in English to look at syntactic properties and also speech graphs. So we're going to compare narrative text with argumentative text in Portuguese and English uh, in all these 96 participants here correlating with proficiency and cognitive measures, right? Uh, Christiane is doing uh, her her data collection. I mean, she finished her data collection in December. We haven't started analyzing it yet. So we also looking at connectivity patterns. Uh, 
and we are doing a longitudinal and a cross-sectional analysis. So those students that whose data we collected in 2020, so we collected data again to see how much they were able to progress in the two languages one year later. Uh, and we also uh, collecting oral data for these students too. So we're going to use speech graphs to analyze that. It's a bunch of data. It's, it's very, very exciting, right? Um, so uh, final considerations. So when academic practices take place in both languages, there are increased opportunities for linguistic and cognitive development, right? And this is something that we have been able to show and we want to show more. Uh, to say that, well, this doesn't happen only when we are talking about lead bilingualism. We need to, you know, to understand the other contexts too, right? Uh, and of course, we agree that bilingual education makes the school more current to connect an interest in interesting situation, situating in today's world. Um, there is a clear need to invest in research that can go further, focusing on investigation of ways that can make bilingual schools practice more effective. And of course, the challenge becomes to build a model of bilingual school that promotes the broad development of children's skills, knowledge, abilities, and attitudes in both languages for all children in Brazil, not just for the ones who, you know, whose parents can pay for that. Right? This is our uh, main goal. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I think that um, we have um, about 10 minutes uh, and we, we have one question in the Q&A. Um, I think that we can do this either in the uh, Q&A or, the, or in the chat, but let me read the question that you have uh, from the uh, Q&A. The question is, um, why do you think there is a difference between German and Italian with respect to maintaining the heritage language? And if Italian has been maintained to a certain extent, has the language undergone changes as well? Um, okay, so let me start with the second one. Uh, Italian has been maintained to a certain extent and has undergone changes as well. So the variety of Italian that is spoken in Portuguese by most of the Italian descendants is called Talian, which is a, you know, a variety that only happens in Brazil, right? Uh, so it's, it's a version of Italian with lots of adaptation and Portuguese vocabulary. And it's really, really interesting. It's the variety that my grandmother speaks. Right. And uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, but um, why? Because German was the German descendants uh, went to live when they came to Brazil in 1875. Uh, they they came to Brazil and they stayed in very small villages and Italians went to larger cities. So the ban and the prohibition of speaking foreign languages, foreign languages were much stronger in large cities, right? So that's one of the reasons why German, the German varieties were kept and they are much stronger nowadays. But it does not mean that Italian or, you know, Italian is, is not spoken in Brazil. It is spoken and there is a huge population um, uh, it's about half of the population that speaks uh, German. And there are other languages too, like uh, Japanese. Uh, Brazil has the, you know, so-called largest Japanese community outside Japan. And lots of these people kept Japanese at home. Mm -hmm. So children speak Japanese as a heritage language, but that Japanese is closer to the Japanese that's spoken in Japan than what happened with other immigrant languages like Polish and, and others. Thank you. Um, other questions? We have, uh, we have time for a few questions or comments. Okay, there's a question in the Q&A. Okay, this is a uh, Question um, from Julio. Um, thank you, Ingrid. Question. In the United States, there is growing debate about teaching ideologies and bilingual education programs, whether languages should be taught separately or following a translanguaging model of mixing languages. 
I was wondering what are some of the ideologies in the bilingual education context in Brazil where you and your students have conducted your research? Okay, that's such a nice question, Julio. Um, we are way behind this discussion here uh, because um, we, I mean, there is so little research and it's such a new context that people haven't even started thinking about the challenges that come with bilingual education, right? Um, so what happens, for instance, when children are learning to read and write is that teachers who teach English in this context were not prepared to teach children in this context. They were prepared mm -hmm. to teach children as, you know, to teach children an additional language not a language that, you know, should be academically developed at school, right? So uh, one of the situations that we commonly see is the Portuguese teacher using a certain teaching method, you know, like a global method to teach them to read in Portuguese. And then the English teacher traveled to the United States and bought some materials, you know, which contains phonic activities. And then, he uses phonics to teach the child. And I mean, the child is there and they learn it anyway, thank God, but it's a, it's not something that has been, you know, um, has been decided. There are no policies there, are, you know, there's a huge lack of studies. So we are sort of crawling in, in that respect, right? Um, uh, there are some uh, research, researchers ha we, who have been defending the idea of translanguaging. There is a lot of resistance because, you know, children are only exposed to English at school. And if we are going to allow them to speak Portuguese all the time, they're not going to learn English, right? So, I mean, there is this uh, insecurity as to, okay, we are going to respect the child's language, which is Portuguese, but you know the context in which the child speaks English is limited. So what should we do? Although the data in the US suggests that children who are in dual language immersion programs, when they maintain the home language, actually do better in English as well. I mean, and that and that and the degree to which they uh, improve increases as they get older. In, within the elementary school years. So one question I have for you, and then I think there's another question, there's some other questions in the Q&A. Um, your data on the graph theory are fascinating. And I do wonder um, with respect to Julio's question about translanguaging, whether the similarity within a given child suggests that translanguaging would be just fine. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, um, I could imagine your data being used as a basis to make that argument. Exactly. Exactly. Because I mean, yeah, the development is going to happen at the child's pace, right? Uh, so it's just a matter of giving them the opportunity to be exposed to the language, right? And that's what teachers are afraid if they use Portuguese, because Portuguese is the language that they bring from home, and it's the language that they use most at school, right? So the, there is a limited amount of exposure to English. So um, teachers normally are flexible in the sense that if the child is not able to speak fluently in, in English, it's okay. You know, we need time for, you know, for the child to develop the language. Um, but still, you know, the... the the main worry is that, well, they need to have opportunities to be exposed and use the language mm -hmm. in the academic context, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the school is, is the place for it, for it right. to happen. Right. right. Thank you. Okay, there are a few more questions. Um, Bernard has a question. Uh, could you do the same type of studies in monolingual schools and thus compare the effects of bilingual versus monolingual education? Okay, thank you for your question, Bernard. I mean, we, we would like to do that. At the same time, it's very complicated because monolingual schools 
are not very happy with the idea of being tested and shown that they are not you know, giving children opportunity to learn other languages, right? Because there is this market issue. Uh, so that's why we didn't go after monolingual, you know, schools for, for that comparison, even though from the research point of view, that would really be good. really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So what we are doing is we are, you know, trying to find contexts in which the amount of exposure differs between one school and the other. Right, so that we might be able to see these effects without looking at monolingual children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, Gus has a has two questions actually. Excellent talk. I have two questions. I'm curious about the prevalence of Spanish in Brazil. Several years ago, I believe Spanish was officially categorized as an official language in Brazil. Has that had any impact? And if so, how is Spanish considered in light of the many other languages that exist in Brazil? Um, okay, so there is this huge movement. The, the last legis legislation regarding education left out Spanish as an obligatory discipline at school. Right, so uh, if the school wants to have Spanish taught, they can do it. Uh, but before they were, you know, obliged to do it. Right, uh, so there has been this huge movement. You know, keep Spanish in the schools, um, and um, th the lack of obligation is going certainly to have an impact on the amount of Spanish. And Spanish is not seen as a language by most uh, language that really needs to be learned because, you know, we can understand Spanish after all, they are just our neighbors, right? Which is not true, but, you know, this is like the common sense with respect to Spanish. So if we're going to, you know, uh, giving, uh, if we're going to give our children an opportunity to learn a language, let's learn a language which is very different, you know, mm -hmm. especially if it's a prestigious language, which is much cooler, you know, they're going, certainly they're going to have good jobs in the future, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we really need public policies that enforce the use of other languages. And then Spanish falls into this category for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So Gus's second question was, I'm very interested in executive functioning. Can the graph methodology provide any insights on the benefits of multilingualism on executive functioning? Uh, okay, so some studies have shown correlation between cognitive measures and uh, graphs, right? Um, so we we are we are doing that actually. You know, the, one of the studies that I reported is going to to look at that in bilingual children, and this has been done in terms of working memory and. Um, uh, and also uh, working memory, yeah, working memory and general measures. So working memory was was the the measure that showed some correlation mm -hmm. with with graph, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Right. right, right. So we will we will stay tuned for those results. Um, a, a question from Justin. Um, I'm studying the cognitive line of inquiry at PUC Rio, and I'm interested in studying foreign language anxiety. In particular, I'm interested in how foreign language anxiety moderates acquisition. Do you know of any good studies or scholars who investigate language anxiety from a cognitive point of view? Um, well, I actually do. So Justin, why don't you email me and we can talk? I, I can, you know, help you with this, uh, this research. So perhaps, right. And perhaps what we can do, Ingrid, is perhaps we can put your, you can put your email in the chat and then anyone who would like to contact you um, can, can do that. Sure. Um, we have one final question and then I think it will be time to be, to end our time together today. Uh, this is from Anna. Um, Thank you for the talk. Question, considering bilinguals in the US have different opportunities of living the language, Mexicans living in the US are surrounded by English language, should we from Brazil base our method and approach when dealing with bilingual education? Our kids in general don't listen to English on a daily basis. Should we base our approach on the US approach for bilingual schools? Okay, so that's exactly the reason why I argue for research that we conduct in Brazil considering our context, because our context is unique and most of research is, is, is done 
either in the US or, or Canada or in other countries where uh, English is the dominant language, right? And children bring another language, Spanish, for instance, to school, but they bring home the school, right? The, they bring home the language. And in Brazil, we're doing exactly the opposite. The children bring Portuguese from home, but they are first exposed to English uh, at school, right? Uh, so the US context would be similar to the indigenous languages in which children bring indigenous language to school and then they learn how to read and write in Portuguese, right? Uh, and in that context, they are sort of, you know, uh, sometimes they, they end up, you know, not following up on their uh, indigenous language because of, of the context, right? So it would be, it would be, you know, um, it would be really important if we could, you know, have more research focusing on, on the Brazilian context, especially considering all this linguistic diversity that we have, you know, uh, research that could uh, pinpoint uh, common points between the different contexts, right? Not just look at research that is done in other places and bringing it to us as if this was the only way to do it. Right? We need to find our way to do it, but we need research to do that. It's not just, you know, basic intuition. So what happens nowadays is that we fall into the category of let's pray for an experienced teacher for my son, you know, because uh, we don't have clear methodology. We don't have a legislation. We don't know much what's going on. Uh, so let's, uh, you know, let's work on research, right? Because there's everything to be done. So we need more. Thank you, Ingrid, for this very wonderful session. And we are very much looking forward to getting past the pandemic and all being able to be together and have more discussion and follow these really fascinating studies and uh, think about how we all might collaborate together uh, in the future. So thank you everyone for being here and a special thank you for Ingrid um, for presenting her research. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you.